You're listening to the Back Porch Talk Podcast. Danny and Jason had many discussions and debates on the back porch while making pivotal investment moves with assets. That's right, with trading cards. They welcome you to the back porch and right into those discussions about current sports news with a fresh and unique twist. So come on and join us. Welcome to the Back Porch Talk Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jason. This is your co-host, Danny. And we have a fun feel show for you today. The agenda for today, week nine, the NFL recaps, the NBA offseason, a shout out on the baseball rookie of the year, in particular for the National League, and something that we have not done yet on our podcast and that is to talk about golf since the masters is actually starting today but first with the week nine nfl recap danny listen uh the only thing i have is honestly with regards to the green bay packers uh beating the san francisco 49ers handling them beating them 34 17 in san francisco Very good games by Aaron Rodgers, who threw for over 300 yards, four touchdowns, and Devontae Adams receiving 173 yards and a touchdown. Valdez Scantling, two catches, but for two touchdowns, 53 yards. And there were actually long distance passes. You know, half the yards that Aaron Rodgers threw went to one receiver, that being Devontae Adams. Lee Lazard may actually suit up and play for this coming Sunday game against uh, the Jaguars. The Packers are going to be lacking here in the receiving core area, but we'll see when Lazard gets back to see how this team really flows offensively. Defensively, Packers played pretty well. Uh, But again, it's against the 49ers who are riddled with injuries. Uh, The other thing... Uh, on the NFL, if the Cowboys look any worse, they need to just go ahead and renegotiate the contract with Dak Prescott right, right now. I really ho- hoped and wish that Dak got his money in the long-term contract, but this may be evidence that a long-term contract is on the horizon. Yep, I It's going to be interesting in the offseason is – if or well, basically, when the Cowboys basically get a top five pick, will that pick go to a quarterback? What are the Cowboys going to do? So that's going to be an interesting topic of discussion. But man, I really wish that Dak would have got his money in a long term deal. Uh, but those are just my uh, quick NFL reactions. How about you, Danny? Kudos to your Packers beating that JV team last week. So I just want to give you a quick shout out and <laughs> 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 for my Falcons. Win and number I see you, three. I see you with your Falcons hat on. Go ahead. Okay. Trying to, trying to rep and everything. Whatever, man. Repping this week. Made me a little nervous. Well, 27 to 6. And all of a sudden, Drew Locke got hot. I'm like, <laughs> here we go, man. Here we go. And Denver had the ball in the fourth quarter down to touchdown. And the Falcons held them to prevail in that win. But they, they held on. Now we have a bye week so they can chill, get their minds right for this uh, the rest of the season because they come back and guess who they play? The New Orleans Saints. <laughs> That'll be an interesting game. A couple other things. Take them on as like my adopted team right now. The Chargers. Man, the Chargers. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm watching that game last week. Los Angeles Chargers and the Raiders. And the Chargers, they were back and forth. They get the ball back at the end. And Herbert throws a lob pass to the tight end. Game winner. No time left. Review the play. They lost. He bobbled the ball. They lost another one in the fourth quarter. Feel for you Charger fans. Man, I, I've been there. Like I just said, the Falcons almost took us there. But we, we got through it. Man, that was tough to watch. Other observation, that Sunday night game, Jason. Tampa, New Orleans. I don't know if Tom Brady was trying to force the issue with Antonio Brown because they did not try to run the ball at all. Rumor is the receiving core outside of Antonio Brown is upset on how that game went down. So very curious on how the Tampa Bay Buccaneers respond this week in that game against Carolina. Man, I think the Bucs will actually, they'll be all right, man. I think it's just a matter of gelling kind of getting things kind of coordinated if you will Mm -hmm. Uh, i think they'll be fine and it's just gonna be real interesting as we come to the end of the season how the bucks will actually 
get over the hump here. Yes. Uh, it's got to be a point in time where uh, things start working like a machine. Mm-hmm. I think every every team comes into some form of a stride at some point in the season. And I think for the Bucks, it's going to have to be towards the end of the season going into the playoffs. So, you know, it's going to be very interesting. All in all, good week. My boys won. I'm happy. So just want to give a shout out to the Falcons. There's a lot happening in this offseason. The NBA and the NBA PA has agreed to start the season on December 22nd. I don't think, honestly, that was in any question. And any doubt, um, because you're starting to talk about business and you're talking about you're starting to talk about money. Uh, money was a big, big motivator here. Uh, so the season starts on December 22nd and the draft is actually happening next week. Free agencies around the corner as well. And so now there's a whole lot of rumors <laughs> going on. We felt compelled to really talk about some of these rumors, some of these combinations or, or possibilities. There's one rumor that the Bucks, I mean, the Orlando Magic was interested in trading Aaron Gordon. Now, how does Aaron Gordon look in a Bucks uniform? How does he look in a whole Bucks system? And who would we trade? And the more I, I thought about this, this may be just one of those, this is put it out there, put everybody off track here. Because quite honestly, I just don't see how Aaron Gordon will really fit in our system or scheme. I kind of consider that to be one of those hot air type of uh, trade rumors. How about you, Danny? Yeah, Aaron Gordon is not a great shooter. Where he could help them is on the defensive end. He's one of those plug and play, switch, long defenders. He rebound, he's athletic, is all good out obviously with the slam dunk contest last few years you got to see some of that athletic ability but i just don't know if he would fit what they're looking for as a starter because that's where i was if he's getting traded somewhere he's starting yep agree so unless you're putting brooke lopez on the bench i don't see how aaron gordon comes here Milwaukee. And then I heard about this trade. I've been going back and forth on it, Danny. Uh, and the trade that I'm speaking of is Bogdanovich and Harrison Barnes coming to Milwaukee. You would have Eric Bledsoe as a key part in that trade. Don't know who else would be a part of that trade package. But that combination of Bogdanovich and then also Harrison Barnes in our lineup is very compelling because in looking at some of the highlights of Bogdanovich as he played with the, the Kings, it seemed like like he is a real good pick and roll type player. I think we can run a lot of action with them and which will diversify our offense. Um, and he can even come off the bench. Harrison Barnes, man, I really, really like that type of player. I mean, he can slash the basket. He has a nice jumper. Uh, he can also, he also has championship pedigree. I, I think that combination would do us very well. It really depends upon who else we give up. But man, that would just be phenomenal to get a starter and Harrison Barnes and Bogdan uh, Bogdanovich to come out to come off the bench. And just to add here, Harrison Barnes three point percentage. We're looking at this past season thirty eight percent from three point. Season before forty percent, close to forty one percent. So he has really value there from a three point perspective. But then can also slash. But then also can have a good mid range game as well. So I think he is a very diverse player, provides some form of scoring, which we desperately need because sometimes we do go on those those droughts. So I, I think having Harrison Barnes would be outstanding and having Bogdanovich possibly coming off the bench would be definitely a, a great pickup there. Then I heard about another rumor, Danny, and this one just really took me by surprise. I did not see this one coming. It kind of makes sense with what's happening down in Houston. Yeah, the mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> Rumors are that Russell Westbrook and James Harden are not happy with all the movement. And we talked about this in our last podcast, how Daryl Murray indicated he needed time with his family. Next thing you know, he's over in Philadelphia with the 76ers. Dan Tony goes to uh, the Nets bench there, the coach with Steve. It's just a whole lot happening down in Houston. They're not happy down there. There's rumors about P.J. Tucker and Robert Covington. That combination coming to Milwaukee in some form of a Bledsoe deal. Again, we don't know what else the Bucks would package with that. And so I, I thought about it. I was like, man, you know, that's an interesting 
combination, just the contracts alone. So Covington uh, is going to make twelve million uh, mm-hmm. this coming year. PJ Tucker is going to make close to eight million. That's not actually a bad trade there. I mean, we mm-hmm. could put in Ilyasova in that deal. I believe he's making seven million with Bledsoe, who's making close to about fifteen or so million, seventeen million. Yeah, somewhere around that range. So that I think combination would work in a trade. I guess my feelings with PJ Tucker. And Covington, let's think about P.J. Tucker. He's known for the corner threes. He's known for his defense, his grit, his Mm -hmm. grind. Covington is known for his slashing to the basket, which is what something we desperately need, actually. And then we, oh, by the way, we added a defender in P.J. Tucker and three-point shooting. Man, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, man, this might not be too bad. Maybe think, okay, which combination would I want more? Do I want the combination of Harrison Barnes and Bogdan Bogdan? Donovich, or do I want the combination of PJ Tucker and Robert Covington? The fact that there are two t- types of the same combinations out there mm-hmm. to me is leading that something is true in terms of having that form of combination. There was another interesting rumor. That rumor entailed or it definitely included the current NBA champions, that being the Los Angeles Lakers. And I heard about the likes of DeMar DeRozan going from San Antonio to the Lakers for Kyle Kuzma and Danny Green. I do that in a heartbeat. And I was like, man, if that happens, whew, I would do that, yeah, from a Lakers standpoint, do that in a heartbeat. Yeah, from a Lakers standpoint, Danny Green, you know, he's a, a great veteran, great locker room presence, but he's slowing down, man. Kuzma started to come on at the end of the season. He was kind of shaking, I think, trying to find his way with Anthony Davis. So when Anthony mm-hmm. Davis didn't play, that's where Kuzma shined. When Anthony Davis did play, you could even see it, man, when they're walking back from, a, like, going to a timeout. Cats weren't giving high fives, you know, dapping up and things. And it may have been, you know, COVID protocols, too, but where is it's like you can kind of sense something with Kuzma, but he did just enough to help them get that championship where there's got to be some level of respect for him. But if you can get DeRozan for those two, I would do that. I mm-hmm. think that would be a great upgrade for them at the shooting guard position. I think the Lakers are thinking Golden State is about to be back. We need somebody to take on Clay Thompson. Can I bring up one rumor? Mm-hmm. Drew Holiday. <laughs> so we talked about Drew Holiday last show and how he would be a great fit for the Milwaukee Bucks. And now there are rumors that the Atlanta Hawks, Eastern Mm -hmm. Conference team, Mm -hmm. and the Boston Celtics are inquiring about a trade for Drew Holiday. And what the package is with Boston as being rumored is Kemba Walker, Gordon Hayward, and a pick, which they're going to flip. They have three picks. They would flip into one pick and send that to New Orleans for Drew Holiday. I think that would be an upgrade from the Boston from the Boston perspective, and they mm-hmm. get rid of some some contract with yep. Kemba, so that puts them in better financial position as well going forward. What are your thoughts on Drew Holiday going to Boston or Atlanta, making the East just a little stronger by adding Drew Holiday to the mix? There were rumors about the Bucks going for Drew Holiday. There were rumors about the Bucks going for CP3. We're not going to be able to get CP3. Because there's rumors about Phoenix Suns getting CP3 and what you just mentioned about Drew Holiday possibly going to the Boston Celtics. My thoughts is the Bucks did it again and where they missed out on an opportunity because Drew Holiday would have been an awesome addition to our squad. Also, the Eastern Conference is going to be extremely tough. This is the makings of the Atlanta Hawks starting to rise. You already got the Nets coming with KD and Kyrie finally coming along. You you have the Philadelphia 76ers who are now rumored to possibly be going after Harden. Yep. And you have the Boston Celtics. The Boston Celtics. So I just think that Eastern Conference is going to be hard. And we're only in the 72 game season. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these teams that got bounced early in the playoffs or didn't make, even make it to the playoffs, they're going to be primed and ready. I just think that. To answer your question, I think it's a missed opportunity by the Milwaukee Bucks yet again. And like I said, it's going to be interesting to see how the Bucks really make this up. This is where we're going to see how well John Horst has uh, developed relationships, uh, especially amongst other GMs, mm-hmm. and 
how well he's trying to put the pieces together because I just feel that it's time for the Bucks to really make a bold move here. So it's still early or trading opens. The moratorium ends on the 16th of November. So that's This is where the rubber hits the road as far mm-hmm. as some of these trades and what happens prior to the 18th in the NBA draft. The rumors with Westbrook going to the New York Knicks. This is my thoughts on Westbrook. Westbrook can't shoot. When you look at Westbrook's stats, his three-point percentage, let's just say it's not good. When he was with OKC, his three-point percentage, 27%, 22%, 33%, 31%, 32%, 31%, 29%, And last year in Houston, 25%. From three point from three point line, mm-hmm. Westbrook cannot shoot, man. And if you look at every time I I see him shooting at the elbow, every time I, he goes into that shooting motion, I'm like, oh, well, that's broke. It's gonna be interesting to see what the Houston Rockets do in terms of trying to trade him. And I'm hearing the New York Knicks. I'm also hearing the Charlotte Hornets. Don't get me wrong, Westbrook has a motor. He's very athletic. He can get to the basket. He can give us. He can give assists. He can score at the basket. He can rebound. Great He's defender. Fl- gr- great defender, but he cannot shoot. And this is a shooting league right now mm-hmm. and where you need spacing on the floor. And he is an offensive liability because anytime you give Westbrook some room and he shoots, you just give him some, give him some room be- and lag down defensively in the lane. It's really going to be interesting to see what the Houston Rockets do and to see who's going to trade for him because we got to think about also not only his lack of shooting, but we also have to think about about his his payroll how much he getting paid his man contract is wild man this year this coming this upcoming year Westbrook's contract is going to be 41 million dollars the year after 43 million dollars and the year after that it's going to be 46.6 million dollars the question is who's going to take on that contract is he going to get a title i mean if he goes to the new york Knicks, you know he ain't gonna get no title there no charlotte if either. he go if he goes to charlotte you know he ain't gonna get no chi- title there I, I feel in a sense kind of bad because he's he, i mean he seems like a great guy great locker room guy everybody loves him man and you know he's gonna tell you like it is i just don't understand that's the best offense to be in if you want to be an offensive player besides yeah. maybe golden state or Milwaukee or some of these op- more open offenses, but they spread out so it, it fits his game. So that's why I'm curious on why once this all shakes out and the off season's over with and where wherever he may end up or if he stays with Houston, because that's the perfect system unless they're planning to change the system too, which then I don't know how they need to change some personnel because they're all small right now. So that's why I'm curious to see. He had his best like field goal percentage. I think he shot like 47 percent from the field this year. Yeah, he shot. Uh, yeah, I mean 47 percent from the field, which is actually his best in his career. Exactly. So that's where I'm curious on what's all behind the scenes going on in Houston. 47 percent from the field was his best. The 25 percent from three point is his second lowest mm-hmm. in his career. So he was just really driving it to the basket, man. We'll see. We'll see. So. The NBA is going to be very interesting this offseason. Uh, in the next week and we'll, next couple of weeks here, uh, we'll see what happens. Now we have another interesting discussion, and that is on the baseball rookie of the year, in particular in the National League. And we do have some great news for the Milwaukee Brewers. Their pitcher, Devin Williams, actually became the rookie of the year. You think about Devin Williams, and I just highly recommend fans, listen, go out to YouTube, go take a look at how he has pitched, and he's made veterans look like fools swinging yes i read a stat here uh, 53 k's and 22 appearances the first reliever to win the award since 2011 one run allowed over 27 innings come on man i mean that's just 53 percent struck out which is the highest in major league baseball history of 20 innings or more come on man Milwaukee change Brew- up is nasty is absolutely stank and <laughs> We're just in a small market. The Brewers, the Bucks, and even Green Bay, small market teams. I just really hope that the Brewers does Devin Williams justice. Please don't trade him. Think we're on the heels of something great. And it'll be just really a shame to really go ahead and trade him. Not even now, but it could even be a year or two down the road. 
And if the Brewers trade them, man, yet again, it's just kind of like here we are just developing some great talent and trading them away. And then we're starting to cycle back over and over and over. The Brewers have had a taste of the playoffs. We've had a taste of the playoffs. And man, let's just keep at it. Congratulations to Devin Williams. What say you, Danny? No, Jay, you hit on everything, man. It's exciting to see someone from the Milwaukee Brewers, you know, get this accolade and with him and hater and that bullpen mm -hmm. they have a lot to look look forward to for sure and now with ryan braun coming off the book that should give them some cap flexibility to make some moves and build on this younger team for the future no it's just watching them because i watched a lot of their games in this 60 game run they had and in the playoffs when they got bounced by the Dodgers. He has a fastball, high 90s, change up. It's, man, like I said, that, that pitch is something else. So hopefully he can get that pitch because you remember Hayter when he came in, mm -hmm. he was just knocking, mowing dudes down. And then that next year, they kind of caught on to him a little bit. So I'm hoping that Devin Williams can have some sophomore success next season and have a great year. <laughs> Another topic that we actually haven't done before on our podcast is that of golf. And for the first time in its history, the Masters Golf Tournament started off today in November with a weather delay. What an awesome weekend that this is being set up for the likes of the NFL, college football, and uh, the Masters uh, Golf Tournament. So that's definitely a new sports combination, something that we've never seen before. Let me ask you this, Danny, with the Masters, uh, in the first round actually happening today, uh, we have Tiger in the hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, who would you select? Is it Tiger or the field? Keep him up, keeping in mind Tiger won last year. I'm definitely going the field, Jason. T. Woods did start off well, but would like to see Tiger go back to back, of course. Just impressive at his age and all the injuries and all the other things he's dealt with. But I think it's going to be tough for him to do. Definitely be interested to see if he can. So I'm not counting him out that way, but I just think there are a lot of good golfers out there and you just hope he can hold up to get to Sunday and at least have a chance mm -hmm. in that final round, try to repeat and repeat his uh, feat of winning the green jacket. You know, every time I think about the masters, I think about an experience that I had. So I had the opportunity to go down to Augusta and this was for work preparing to go down there. I, you know, obviously talked to uh, some of my coworkers who actually worked there and, you know, I talked to them well in advance and they mentioned, well, you know, for the masters, a lot of us tend to rent out our homes for the onslaught of people that's going to, you know, come to Augusta, Georgia. And that's an opportunity for a lot of our people at the site to make additional money and where they just totally decide to leave for the week. I went like maybe a week after Augusta and I was with a coworker. So we decided to go grab some dinner after, after work, go to the restaurant. And I remember sliding into uh, the booth, the waitress comes and gives us the menu. Right. And so look at the menu, you know, we're, we're hungry. The restaurant we were, we were at, it was not too far from the golf course. So get the menu, look at the menu, coworker and I chat, whatever, look at the menu, waitress comes back, starts to go order, take the order. I proceed in, in ordering what I would like to have. The waitress looks at me and says, sorry, sir, we, we don't have that available. What? How are you not going to have this item, you know, available? It's a popular item. Yeah. We, we don't have it available. And so I was like, okay, well, let me go on to the next the next item. And I ordered that. She looks at me, sir, we don't have that available either. What? <laughs> and she says, well, we, we don't have a whole lot because after the masters, it takes a while for some of these restaurants to restock on food because throughout the course of the week, for masters, that's their money time. That's when they, when the restaurants and the local economy does extremely well. It takes a while for some of these restaurants to really stock back up <laughs> on food. We were like, oh man, so this is going to be kind of like almost the same thing no matter what restaurant we go to. She, she was like, it, it could be. We decided to get on up and try another restaurant. Because uh, obviously they didn't have what we really what we really wanted, and so when we got to the restaurant, we were actually able to order 
some food there. It turned out okay. But I, th- I thought about that and I, th- and I thought about in this November where there's not a lot of fans that's going to be, you know, available. The restaurants who usually gets great money and funds from the visitors and all, they're not going to have that. And so my prayer, my hope is that though that local economy um, can hang on until the next Masters when fans are able to actually, you know, really join and really mm-hmm. enjoy the Masters. This Masters is, is quite interesting because just as it is in November, yeah. there was actually an awesome announcement made at the Masters here as well with mm-hmm. the likes of Lee Elders. And for those who don't know who Lee Elders is, I highly recommend you go look him up um, because he has been announced that he will be in addition to the honorary start to the 2021 Masters. And for those of you who don't know what that means, you have the likes of Gary players and also Jack Nicholas, who usually starts the tournament off by going off the tee. It used to be Arnold Palmer also, but since his passing in 2016, it has been just Gary players and Jack Nicholas. Now they're going to include Lee Elders, who is the first black man who played in the Masters. Not only that announcement, but they've also announced the Lee Elders Scholarship, which is going to be two scholarships in Elders' name that will will be awarded annually to both a man and a woman on golf teams at Payne College, which is a historically black college and university, which is actually located in Augusta, Georgia. Now, at this particular moment in time, there is not a female or women uh, golf team, but they are, they meaning PGA and, and Augusta National, they're going to actually fund the start of this women's golf team. How awesome cool. is that, man? It's cool, man. But, you know, in, in doing some more research about it, though, Danny, because I I really want fans to do some research on Lee Elders because he, man, he, in reading this his story, it was absolutely phenomenal. And yes, he's the first black man to actually play in the Masters. That's an accomplishment itself. There's a, a story there off of GaryPlayer.com. And Gary Players, he was a master champion himself. Gary Player, he's actually from South Africa. One of the things that Gary Player has done. He convinced the then prime minister who the New York Times called a granite symbol of apartheid. But Gary Players actually went to the prime minister to advocate to have the elders play in the South African Open and the South African PGA Championship. This is back in a day when apartheid was in its prime. Again, Gary Player went to the prime minister, he went to his office, and he says that he was shaken in his shoes. And this, again, according to GaryPlayers.com, he asked if elders could play, and eventually the prime minister obliged. So arrangements were made for elders to become a golf ambassador. So you would had to make visits in Africa and other parts of Africa to really garner influence, garner some grace in other in other countries before going to South Africa. Elders went to Liberia, Uganda, Nigeria, and Kenya. At each stop, he actually met with heads of state and he performed an exhibition and all. So kind of teach them how to play golf. When he eventually got to South Africa, obviously he played all that stuff. But before he even had to do that, he had to talk to the U.S. State Department to basically really Really kind of negotiate how this is going to work in terms of security, in terms of protection for his family, protection for whoever's going to watch him play, all that stuff. And so when Lee Elders played, you know, one of the things that he also wanted to do was to have black and white people to be able to join together and watch the golf tournament together, which they actually did do. That story alone, the Masters, him being the first black man to play in the Masters, yes, that's a huge feat. Don't get me wrong. But man, to be able to play in South Africa in the midst of apartheid, man, now that's a story that I don't think is told nearly enough. I agree. So thank you, Lee Elders, for your determination, your grit, your sacrifice uh, in terms of spreading hope to a nation that otherwise uh, possibly didn't have any semblance of hope, especially during the apartheid era. And as we're talking about HBCUs paying college again, some funds towards their golf teams, I have to say that it was mentioned in the news that also that the inaugural 
Advocates Professional Golf Association, the AG, excuse me, the A. PGA Tour collegiate rankings was announced and four out of the top five individual student athletes that were named came out of the Florida A&M University. I am so excited. I am so excited for these student athletes, Mobe Dillard, Mahindra Lutchman, Ethan Mangum, and also Cameron Riley, who at last season, they went on a tear and where they won four consecutive tournaments, ranking them number one in HBCU nation uh, as the number one HBCU golf team in the nation. And that translated in them being ranked in the top five, four out of the top five coming from one university, that being the Florida a &M University. This announcement of the APGA, part of the PGA Tour's commitment to uh, racial equity and inclusion, part of the plan announced, as part of the plan that was announced, and I'm getting this from famuathletics.com. Again, that's famu, F-A-M-U, athletics.com. This announcement comes as part of the PGA Tour's commitment, again, to racial equity and inclusion. And as part of the plan announced, uh, the tour is pledging at least, at least, $100 million over the next 10 years to support nonprofit organizations whose services directly address the inequities and disparities that affect African American citizens, as well as underrepresented and underserved populations in the communities in which tournaments are conducted. So that's a huge commitment. Kudos uh, mm -hmm. for this commitment. Just a, glo a global sport like golf, being at a, on an HBCU campus, when you think about Steph Curry providing resources to Howard for their men's golf team, this is the opportunity for the expansion of a sport to the minority community. So this has just been an awesome, awesome past couple of days and even a couple of weeks about Lee Elders, his story, but then also about the student athletes at Florida A&M University, four of them uh, being ranked in the top five yeah. of this new college ranking. Thank you for joining us at Backports Talk Podcast. You can also join us on Twitter by tweeting us at back underscore podcast. For more information, you can go to our website, which is backportstalkpodcast.com. You can also email us at backportstalkpodcast at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining us and remember that there's enough hate in the world, so go ahead and spread a little love.